world, people are concerned and are beginning to talk more and more about our addiction to oil. And yet, everywhere you turn, the SUVs, the Hummers are crowding the streets. And previous efforts to put more ecologically sensitive vehicles on the streets have not fared very well. And so there is this kind of disconnect between what we're reading in the editorial pages and what we see in personal behavior. In uh, previous uh, editions of Idea City, we've uh, heard from people who've talked about flying cars and uh, space elevators. And so it doesn't seem entirely implausible that Andy and his firm in England is going to come up with a new and novel way of powering a motorcycle. Andy, Thank you very Andy much. Eggle. Thank you. I hope you still clap at the end. <laughs> I used to drive to work every day, and the drive was a complete nightmare because of the traffic. So I began to get this feeling of sort of disconnect between what I was earning my family's bread doing uh, and the impact it was having on my own life. It once took me four and a half hours to do 25 miles back from work one night. And I was sitting in a Jaguar, uh, feeling very pleased with myself for about half an hour, and then began to wonder what this was all about. And eventually, I've ended up coming out of corporate life and working with an ex, a bunch of ex-colleagues and friends who have developed the machine I'm going to show you now. NASA, eat your heart out. <laughs> this is the way British do product development. <laughs> <coughs> Look at that seat. <laughs> we called it a splinter group. <laughs> you see? <it's laughs> Too uncomfortable to sit on for a second. But that is the Iron Maiden, which was the first attempt at putting a fuel cell in a motorcycle. And this is, again, our purpose-built test track in the local park. <laughs> now, that's an experienced motorcyclist riding that bike. And this is a picture of a scientist riding a motorcycle. <laughs> Now, this is what a year later. Now, I didn't design this bike, I didn't build it, I wasn't responsible for the technology. I'm just a marketing guy, so I'm not going to claim any credit for this. But just watch what the design firm, which is a company in from London called Seymour Powell, have managed to do with that group of people in less than one year. The bike weighs about 100 kilos. Uh, the top speed is 50 miles an hour. And the production version uh, is designed to do 100 miles on seven ounces of compressed hydrogen. The bike's design is supposed to allow it to go to be an urban commuting vehicle, um, but also to go off-road. And we've had quite a, an interesting accolade from uh, a, a magazine called uh, Trail Bike Magazine, who figure that this bike could be something that will enable them to save their hobby because they're being banned from country areas because of the pollution and because of the noise. This bike runs almost completely silently, and its only emission is water vapor. The next clip is going to show you how this concept vehicle opens up and enables you to detach the power unit completely. Now, that power unit contains a fuel cell stack which generates a constant kilowatt. That's about one and a half horsepower of power. Underneath, that's at the top of the core, as we call it. At the bottom, there's a gas bottle, which holds the compressed hydrogen. 
at 350 atmospheres. That's about uh, just over 5,000 pounds a square inch. That also contains all of the control electronics to make sure that the power reaches the back wheel in a way which you would recognize and which won't pitch you off. Now, interestingly, we, the core is hybridized with some batteries, and the batteries generate about five kilowatts or about seven horsepower of power. So you've got about seven and a half to eight horsepower of, of available power. When you accelerate, you draw all the power from the fuel cell and the batteries. When you're cruising, the fuel cell is sufficient to keep the bike moving and it trickle charges the batteries so that the, the bike, bike's batteries are never depleted by more than 20 or 30%. The question that everybody asks is, well, that bike looks fine, but where do you get the hydrogen from? So if you were, in case you were wondering, I'm going to tell you. At the moment, um, the hydrogen is only available from an industrial source. Now, that flame that you see at refineries, for example, is composed largely of hydrogen, and it's just wasted. Now, we can use that to power the bike. The bike needs 99.9% .9 pure hydrogen, and it uses uh, oxygen from the air to produce an electrochemical reaction in the fuel cell to power the bike. Okay, so it doesn't need anything else. It doesn't need pure oxygen like many other fuel cells and it's not pressurized. It works at ambient temperatures and pressures, which is how we were able to make it small enough to fit on a bike. All the air going in has to be filtered because these things are easily poisoned. But we're working with uh, industrial gas suppliers now um, because there is actually a hydrogen infrastructure all over the developed world, which is where this bike will sell first. Um, it's just not by the roadside yet. You know, so we, what we're doing now is working in the launch cities where we're going to uh, sell this bike. We're working with companies who have agreed to put in uh, a semi-permanent refueling station using bottled gas in order to be able to support a smallish fleet, two or three hundred vehicles in each city. Now, the, the, the good thing is that there's more stuff coming along. It's not ready yet, but we have a reformer um, in the company. A reformer is a machine uh, into which you can pour a feedstock. In this case, the preferred feedstock is ethanol, which is alcohol made from biomass. And I've seen this thing work. It's quite amazing. You pour ethanol in one end, and out of the other end, you get hydrogen. Now, if you have a compressor, you can then compress that hydrogen at home quite safely and use it to refuel the bike. Now, there are all kinds of regulations and things that you know, we have to look at, and there are safety considerations. Um, but actually, it's perfectly feasible for us to have a local supply chain of ethanol, which can be produced from corn or wheat or sugar beet or the green remnants from a sugar cane crop, anything that you would throw away. And in the process of producing hydrogen, the reformer emits CO2, but that's the only the same amount of CO2 as was in the original vegetation. So if you'd left it to rot, that's how much would have escaped to the air. And that's where we get the term ENV. It's really a genuinely, if we can do that package, a genuinely emissions neutral vehicle. And so for the first time in automotive history, and I'm a bit of a student of the automotive industry, I've been working in it for 25 years. This is the first time that we've managed in any segment of the market, and it happens to be a two-wheeler, where we can get an affordable vehicle which has the same performance envelope as a conventionally engined machine, um, which is, runs completely silently and is emissions free. Thank you.